Hi, so my name is um, CJ Lee. I'm the coaching development manager from Sport Hampshire and Isle of Wight. Um, I was due to give this presentation on May the 4th of September, but unfortunately due to um, my own poor planning, um, I didn't attend. So I apologise to anybody who attended the original session and um, uh, I wasn't there. Um, what I'm going to aim to do is, uh, this was originally an hour session, but I've tried to condense it to around kind of 30 minutes. Um, and what it should do is give you a brief overview of some of the issues around both coaching workforce development and um, coach specific development. Uh, so what I'm going to do is use a couple of videos, uh, use some slides and hopefully talk, uh, talk you through some of the uh, main concepts. Uh, following uh, this presentation, if you have any more questions or you'd like me to talk to you specifically about coach development and workforce development in your clubs, then I'm more than happy to come out to your clubs individually and uh, go through some of the issues and maybe assist you with some workforce planning. Okay, so we're going to start with a presentation by a colleague of mine, uh, Jane Booth from Golf, who's going to introduce this concept of right place, right coach, right time. Jane Booth and I'm coaching manager for the PGA. If you remember nothing else from the next three minutes 20 seconds I want you to remember right coach, right place, right time which is the 21st century vision for golf coaching across Great Britain and Ireland. So why coaching? Why is coaching so important? The statement you see before you now highlights that coaching is business critical. This is great because this person who made this statement sits in the House of Lords and is somebody who has had a massive influence on the growth of sport and sports development coaching over the past few years. As coaches you've always known the importance that you have and the importance of your role and influence on people playing the game of golf. Golf coaching is absolutely central to the growth and the development of people playing golf. Remember if you will when you're at school and that teacher who inspired you or that teacher who didn't inspire you and actually put you off sport for life. We believe that every single golfer has different skills, different needs, different abilities and different potential. And within the right coach, right place, right time philosophy, we believe that it's really critical to understand what those differences are. What you see before you now is our vision for the future. This is our coaching system vision of where we want to be. We start by putting the golfer at the heart of everything we do. It's really essential that we understand what people want out of their golfing experience. We can therefore start to work out the skills, the knowledge, the experience required by coaches who work with these people. What we also need to do is work out how many people, how many coaches we have at what level. Once we know all this information, we can start to recruit, train, support and retain the right coach in the right place at the right time. The key thing here is that we always check we know where we are and where we want to be. We don't assume that things stay the same forever. You'll also see on this diagram the logos of our partners at the bottom. This vision has been developed in partnership with all of the home countries and the amateur unions. We start by putting the golfer at the heart. Do we really understand who our golfers are and what they want from their coaching experience? If we do understand this, we can become more effective about developing coaches. The next stage of our vision is actually to really understand what it is that our coaches need to know and need to be able to do to meet the needs of those players. So if we can identify what golfers need, we can start to work out how to educate, how to develop the right coach. What we also have to consider is some workforce planning and workforce development. Do we actually know what coaches we have out there? And do we know what their aspirations and ambitions are? So if you're a coach, do you know the type of players you want to be working with? We believe that if we start to understand what players need and start to understand what coaches are, then we can recruit, train, support and retain excellent coaches who meet the needs of those golfers. And this is our vision for the future. This may take us 10, 20, 30 years to achieve, but we believe that if we put time and effort into ensuring that we develop the right coach in the right place at the right time, our success will be that we actually end up helping all golfers to achieve their success. That may be success as an elite golfer, but it may be that their potential is to achieve 20 handicap or simply to achieve their first round of golf. So, if you remember nothing else, remember right coach, right place, right time. It's our 21st century vision for golf coaching across Great Britain and Ireland. Thank you.
Okay, so um, Jane does a great job there in, in about three minutes of um, going over the main kind of the key concepts of right coach, right place, right time, and understanding the type of coaching workforce that we need within our clubs. So whilst Jane talks about it from a golf perspective, um, a lot of the issues are, are totally transferable to any number of sports, including that of swimming. So I guess um, the, 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 the main issues from uh, that uh, introduction are, um, as a club, you need to think about how many, how many people uh, are you looking to deliver your coaching towards? That, 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 the answer to that question will determine how many coaches you require to make sure that you have a good, a good ratio between coach and participant. And lastly, you need to consider at what level are you um, pitching your coaching sessions? And essentially what, what Jane introduces is this, this idea that coaching development is totally inter interdependent on the age, stage and aspirations of your swimmers. So what you need to do reasonably early on is, is to decide what kind of club are you going to be? Are you going to be a, a club which is about the, the first experience an athlete has in your sport? So you, you're teaching them how to have, you know, you're allowing them to have fun. You're teaching them the fundamentals, the, 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 the kind of rudimentary mechanics of the sport. Are you a club that is about trying to develop um, athletes? So looking at athletes meeting their potential, maybe at, in a more competitive environment. So looking at teaching them how to train before we get to the stage where we're teaching them to compete, maybe at a local level, maybe it's school galas, maybe it's a local competition, or are we at the kind of training to win stage where we're really looking at those athletes with elite potential who may be uh, swimming at a representative level or are looking to uh, win places in the national team. And all of that, all of those decisions, all of those questions will determine the type of coaches that you that you need to um, employ within your clubs. It's really important that very early on we establish what our net what our local coaching network um, looks like. And again, that's a combination of having a good balance of clubs. So again, looking at clubs that are uh, performing different roles depending on the age stage and aspiration of our of our athletes so do we have enough clubs which are at that introductory level do we have those clubs for the next stage stage on which um which focus on developing athletes do we have enough um clubs or representative opportunities to help those athletes who want to go on and swim at the elite level and having that balance within a network is absolutely critical to ensuring that we give our athletes every chance of enjoying both enjoying their sport but also achieving their potential the network's also really powerful in, in ensuring that we maximize the 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 relatively minimal resources that we have available so whether that's coaching resource and we look at networks as a way to share coaching expertise across clubs or or whether it's about sharing good practice so again that we that we continue to build a really stable network and performance pathway for athletes um, and lastly it's about understanding the resources that exist maybe just outside of swimming so for instance at the end of this presentation we'll talk about some of the resources that are available to clubs and to individual coaches through other coaching networks like Coaching Hampshire and Isle of Wight. So I guess the questions uh, we need to be asking ourselves are what kind of club do we want to be? Where do we fit uh, within that performance pathway? Where do we fit within the network? We also need to ask ourselves who are our athletes and make sure that um, what we deliver is, is related, is closely related to their, to their age, to their to the to the stage to the maturation and to their aspirations and expectations and that we're very kind of clear about that and we have some really kind of honest dialogue both within the club with parents and with participants about what kind of club uh, we're trying to deliver and lastly it's always a useful exercise and at least on a yearly basis to reassess what does success look like 
So as a club, when you celebrate success, are you celebrating um, the number of medals at championships? Are you celebrating the number of athletes that um, come end up competing at, um, at national in national squads? Are you looking at um, success as the number of people who stay in swimming or learn to swim um, or who just enjoy the sport? So we need to be very clear about those things very, very early on. Uh, I'm going to play you a, a quick video which starts to look at the specific role of kind of coach development. So ensuring that as coaches, we continually have the right skills to ensure that participants have the best possible experience and the best possible chance of meeting their potential and um, and basically enjoying enjoying the sport. So we're going to look at a video which is part of a series um, developed by Sports Coach UK, who's effectively the national governing body for coaches in England. Um, and this will give you a, a small snippet into some of the some of the ideas and some of the factors involved in developing the right coaches with the right skills. In terms of a kind of um, a practical philosophy, uh, we want the kids to do as much as they can. We want them to repeat things over and over again. Repetition is not exciting, but it's a proven method for helping people kind of learn and adapt and adopt new skills. Awesome. Go again. Go again. Um, and we want them to be engaged in problem solving. We want them to be put under pressure. So we try and create control situations where they're put under pressure and they've got to solve problems, hopefully using the skills, the technical skills, that we've helped them de develop. When I say anything, you know what I'm talking about. Coaching should be a partnership between the coach and the participants. And as part of that partnership, there's, a, there's got to be an agreement. We, we use four E's, or, or at least I use four E's in my coaching, and that's that both the coach and the participant agree to bring energy, to be enthusiastic, to show emotion in a controlled and, and, and reasonable way depending on the environment. And lastly, if we get the first three things right, we end up with enjoyment. And that's what we try and get our kids to buy into. I, I think it's central to, to help youngsters become their own coaches so they can analyse what they're doing so they don't have to be so dependent upon uh, being coach fed. And then the other thing is, is for them to uh, is to just become more independent. And one of the things I feel it's our responsibility to do is to help youngsters become more independent and, and not dependent on coaches and parents so much. So we, we have to have quite a lot of coach head and parent head on helping both, both parents and coaches understand that youngsters need to develop their own uh, interdependence rather than being totally dependent on yeah. coaches and parents. So I think if I had my time again, I'd be happy with um, the... The way I've developed as a coach. And the one thing I'd want to to know more about is probably the, the more science behind my coaching. So a bit more more evidence. Do quite a lot based on beliefs, um, which is you know, my past, what I know, what I understand. But I think all the time things are changing, and it's just keeping up with uh, with the science. You do your coaching courses. You you have your experience, and from that that's the way you coach, so they're your, your beliefs. And there's another way of coaching, which is says, well, we only do this if we've got the evidence that it works. And and I think coaching is a bit of a cross between an art and a science. It's not just science. I think it's a human activity. It's about communication. It's about working together. So, But I do think that there's more and more evidence-based coaching out there, more science to help support coaches do their job. So I just think that perhaps I it would help me if I had more um, science behind the, the coaching that I do. The older I get, the more I realise I know less, if, if you understand that. I used to think years ago that I knew everything, and now I realise I don't know everything at all. Now I realise that there's an awful lot more to learn, and, and in fact my way isn't the only way. Learning from other people is really important. 
And interestingly with that, one of the things we've done in terms of trying to help the, the seller become their own coach is to help them understand another part of their business, which is just the technical side of the activity. So, so they understand that the, the nuts and bolts are the components of the activity. Then they'll often do that on their own. They'll, we'll bring them together in a small group so that they'll, they'll share the kitchen contest and things like that. And we'll them. Then we'll put it under pressure. And, and I know that happens in most sports. Then we put it under a lot of pressure. We'll test it under pressure. And then, of course, if it's not working under pressure, we'll take it all the way back to the component stage, rebuild it. And then hopefully what we're trying to do is to get to the point where, when the activity is automatic. And that's what we were hopefully trying to achieve. What we, we were using that as, as a coaching tool. Now it's actually, um, and uh, the children are using that tool. So, so they know that actually I'm not coping with this. So I'm, I'm so far out of my comfort zone right now. I need to stop what I'm doing, press the reset button, yeah. and go back to the component, find out what's not working quite right, and then, and then move back up the chain. And getting, getting youngsters to do that, that helps in their self awareness and ability to connect. That's awesome. yeah, for me, is when I was uh, an inexperienced coach. I was very focused on the session and the activities that, that we uh, built up to make the session. The thing that I'd forgotten was, if I'm a kid coming to these sessions, is the coach serving up what I want? Because unless we give them what they want initially, you never get a chance to give them what you as the coach think that they might need. And I think it's a very complicated equation. And if you meet their initial needs and help them to fall in love with the game, then I've got a better chance of them coming back and improving them over a longer period of time. I'd gone straight into the football bit, and just because you were a kid, that really didn't matter. So one of the, it was a real turning point in the way that I approached most of my interactions with, with children. When I'm planning now or when I'm working with kids, it is about the kids. Football just helps to be. children into the way they want to learn and, and certainly guide them into the way they want to progress. I think a little bit of it is, it is um, guided by me but I think some of it is self-discovery in the hope that they're going to build on their own knowledge and the skills base and because of their own enjoyment and the motivation that they want to carry on performing and they want to carry on doing something. That to me is more self-discovery in terms of changing sometimes the activity, changing the vocabulary, changing the way that you speak to the students so that they find their own level in which to work at. Okay, so again, there's a, a real kind of quick snapshot at some of the issues around kind of developing coaches and some of the skills and competencies coaches require um, and there you've got four coaches, all of whom coach um, young people or children and all with n not too dissimilar kind of approaches, a real understanding as kind of the coaching, the, the various coaching levels they're working at, uh, looking at kind of co different coaching styles. So that balance between kind of telling, showing and involving um, and understanding uh, very, very clearly the various learning styles of different different um athletes so making sure that as coaches we really understand we really kind of develop the appropriate skills to make sure we maximize the learning opportunity as well as not forgetting that kind of enjoyment um, component which is really critical to kids staying motivated staying focused and uh, staying involved Now, I'm, I'm sure that um, every club in the country, um, uh, season to season, year to year, has various challenges in, in ensuring that not only do they have the right coaches um, with the right skills, but also finding coaches that are available to, to coach at the, the right times. So um, I, I guess that's more of a challenge in swimming than in, in maybe some sports, given that 
um, it's quite it's quite uh, frequent for coaches to have to be available kind of really early mornings or um, after schools. Um, so really, when we look at kind of workforce development, it's about making sure we've got the right mix of coaches, um, paid coaches, maybe full time, maybe some part time and the use of volunteer coaches to ensure that we're going to have a workforce that is available when we need them to meet the needs of our of our athletes at their varying stages. Um, in terms of right place, well, it's very much connected to right time, but it's really about understanding that relationship between the, the competencies of a coach and uh, the needs and expectations of the athletes that they're coaching. Uh, very much in the UK for a lot of years, we've been very focused on the technical aspects of coaching. So as a coach, if I wanted to, to develop, my um, my choices were very much about starting at level one, progressing through level twos and level threes, and maybe aiming for a level four or level five. And a lot of the content of those co courses tended to be very focused on technical competencies. Um, encouragingly, uh, the introduction of uh, courses like the UKCC um, mean that we're now a lot more focused on not just the what we're coaching but very much more on the how, when and, and why we're coaching particular skills at a given time. Sorry that's my cat. Uh, um, so again we need to make sure that we've got the right coaches that meet the needs of, of, of participants in the various environments whether they be school, club, community, private teaching, um, uh, development and, and um, elite competition. So that really kind of starts to lead us up towards this idea of, of, plan, of planning for our coaching workforce and we, we, we try and break this down into about six different areas. So we're looking firstly at the recruitment stage. So we need to know who we're recruiting, when do we need to recruit those coaches, preferably not at that kind of 11th hour when a coach says that they're going to leave and we hope that they're not going to leave so we don't really do very much about it, but that we've got some, some kind of um, a legacy plan so that as a coach is reaching the end of their career, we've already got a number of coaches who can backfill their spots but also as part of that recruitment stage it's about understanding um, the value of giving coaches very kind of clear roles and responsibilities so looking at development of job descriptions looking at personal specifications so we're not just looking at qualifications but we're also looking at those soft skills that coaches require around things like um, organization communication building rapport with athletes and then using interviews and um, uh, demonstrations by coaches to fully assess whether that coach is going to be the right fit for your club. Then we need to know uh, what we're developing um, and at the end of this or I think attached to an email I'm going to give the clubs a list of um, possible development opportunities so that would be qualifications, coach education and CPD that are available to coaches so They've got a, a, a they've effectively got a shopping list from which to choose from, so they can identify quite quickly. These are my strengths, but equally these are the areas that either I know very little about, or I'm re really keen to develop because I think this is going to really help me in my interaction with athletes. Deployment is all about ensuring that we deploy coaches when they're ready at the appropriate times and in the appropriate places. So whether it's about when when we introduce that coach to a situation, uh, when they can coach independently and on their own, or whether they need to be mentored, or whether it's about simply the time at which we use that coach. So whether it's in an early morning session, whether we have to think about employing a part-time coach, or whether we can use a voluntary coach in that place um, that's all that's all our, our kind of deployment issues then we look at management and we want to make sure that in, in every club we've got somebody responsible for managing the performance of coaches now quite often that that will be a head coach um, but even even where that where that happens and there's a head coach there that can act as a critical friend and a, men, a mentor and can performance manage their coaches somebody still needs to manage the head coach so it might be a committee member it might be the chairman of the club 
who sits down with the club, the head coach from time to time and looks at what the club wants to achieve, whether we're, whether we're on target, how coaching is developing, whether or not they need more resources, whether people need to be looking at um, more more uh, coach education or development opportunities. Um, it's really important that we don't neglect coaches and leave them to their own devices. Uh, the last two areas are, are interconnected. It's really massively important, whether or not we pay the coach or not, that we recognise their, their, their contribution to the club. Um, as Jane said at the beginning, coaching is absolutely business critical to the effectiveness and success of clubs and the experience of athletes. So it's it's massively important that we don't overlook the the, the reward element. And reward is ve uh, very much connected to retention. We want to keep good coaches for as long as humanly possible. But at the same time, we need to plan ahead for when those coaches may be reaching the end of their careers and ensuring that we're backfilling those those spots with equally um, capable and uh, experienced coaches. So um, in conclusion, I guess the, uh, it's more of a, a series of questions. Um, we need to look as clubs and as coaches, do we have a clear vision and mission? Um, if we have that, how, how are we measuring our success? Are success measured by medals? Is it measured by enjoyment? Is it measured by um, sustained participation level? There's any number of measures that we can use, but we need to be really clear about what those measures are. What does success look like? We need to ask where, where does our club sit in the performance pathway? So in the wider network um, and in that participation pathway, where does our club sit? Are we about introduction? Are we about fun? Are we about teaching people how to swim? Or are we further down the pathway where we're looking at the t talent development and talent um, improvement? Or are we, are we at, towards the end of the pathway where we're about um, churning out elite swimmers? Do we have the right coaches in the right places at the right time? Well, that's been the overall fit theme. And I think those, those are three really useful questions to start that workforce planning process. Um, right coaches, do we have the, the right skill, the right competencies? Are we providing those coaches with the right developmental opportunities and support to pursue um, development as an ongoing, uh, as ongoing practice? Do we have enough coaches in the right places at the right times of the day? And do we have the right coaches to meet the needs of specific athletes? So all of our all of our coach development should be very participant and athlete focused. Last couple of questions. Do we manage our coaches effectively? So do we have um, systems, whether it be around recruitment, development, deployment um, or retention and reward that ensure that we not only maintain our coaches, but we make sure that we're developing the right coaches at all uh, all the time. And lastly, um, you know, will will you, as a result of looking at some of these issues, do anything differently? So really, the the value in in seeing a, a presentation like this is to critically reflect on what you're currently doing, your current practice, and ask yourself: Are there things that we could do differently? Are there things that we could do better? Um, that's pretty much the end of the presentation, but I, what, what I wanted to do was also just point you towards a couple of resources that exist kind of outside of swimming. Um, Coaching Hampshire and the Isle of Wight is part of the coaching network. Um, we, we have a, a website which is predominantly around uh, promoting courses, providing funding opportunities. So we have a, a coaching bursary where we can deliver up to £500 uh, per participant each year. Um, we really uh, try and promote kind of coordinated bids. So where a number of clubs recognise that there are there's a coaching need or a development need, where those clubs can get together and maybe we can put something on that is a lot more kind of efficient and cost effective. We're really keen to do that. We promote coaching jobs, so if you as a club are looking to recruit um, a, a, a particular coach, you can post an advert on our coaching website. Or if you're a coach looking for work, again, you can come to the coaching website and we try and make as many links with local clubs so that they're aware that this resource is in addition to their own websites and their own networks. 
We provide regular news, so we, we try and make sure we collect things that are both national and local. And again, we're very keen to hear from clubs who have kind of good news stories, um, stories of, of how they're succeeding or how they're adapting and changing um, in, the, in the kind of sport network. So we're really keen to have those kind, that kind of dialogue with clubs. We try and share as much good practice as possible. And again, wherever you uh, have good practice, please feel free to come and share that with us. And lastly, we provide consultancy. So as I'd offered at the beginning, if there are clubs who want to review what they're doing around their coach and work workforce development, then I'm more than happy to sit down with them. Again, it's ideal if I can do that in groups, but I'm, I'm equally happy to come out to individual clubs and, and have a talk about how we can move your coach and workforce development forwards. So this is our website, Coaching Hampshire and Isle of Wight. Um, it's coachinghampshireiow.co.uk. And on there, you can see a range of services. The, the site's always developing, always moving forward. And in addition to the site, we have a number of other net, uh, social network spaces like Facebook. We use WordPress as a blog. We're trying to encourage coaches to blog as part of reflect, reflective practice. We have a YouTube channel where we update videos, either our own videos or videos of partners, which are again around kind of good practice in coaching and coach development, and also about promoting the, the excellent work that goes on within the county. And lastly, we have Twitter, which is reasonably new to us, but we try and um, update our coaches. Anyone who follows us on Twitter can find out the very latest uh, that's going on in our work. So I hope um, that session was useful. I apologise that it was a little bit late um, and I do have rambled a little. Um, it's not as easy talking to a screen as it is to a group of people, but hopefully that um, was a useful introduction to some of the issues around developing workforces and developing coaches. Thank you very much for your time and um, I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Bye.